to Overdrive continues, brought to you by FanDuel, bringing you everything from the opening line of the final score. Brian Hayes, Dave Festchuk, and Michael DeStefano, KL's brother, in here. We've got Steve Phillips coming up here in a moment. Might fire up uh, the filter. We haven't done that in a while, Al's brother. Or you're going to have uh, takes for us, I guess, and we will. they will have to be filtered through Dave and I on whether or not we agree with them, disagree with them, or vehemently disagree with them. Yeah, it's been a while. It's been a while since we've done the filter. But, I like you it. know, I, as always, I've always got things percolating up in the brain of mine and thinking, mm-hmm. should I say this out loud? Going to need your help to, to tell me. All right, you can send that tweet out. Okay. Or if it's a terrible take, just don't even bother. Oh, we won't. We will, we will not <laughs> be shy to let you know it's an awful, horrible, horrendous take. Because there really generally are three options, right? Yeah. I find in the, in the in this business, it's either people agree with you, disagree with you, or really, really disagree with you. Yes. Like, no one really, really agrees with you. No, never. <laughs> you know, it's like, yeah, that's actually a pretty good point. Or, nah, it's kind of stupid. Or, you're such an idiot, how do you have a show? I wish you didn't exist. <laughs> yes. Like, that's kind of the three. We get that one a lot. Yeah, we get that one a lot. That's that's that's, that's the okay. tenure of today, today's society. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, uh, yeah. Al's brother, put it back in your smoker with your brisket. Right, exactly. You know, never let it out again. How dare you? How dare you? Yeah, but, um, yeah, exciting time because we've got Canada-Argentina tomorrow. We've got the Olympic Games coming up. Right, we got uh, the British Open, I guess, in a week. We've been asking people something to chew on. Brought to you by Boston Pizza, Canada's favorite sports bar. Summer's short, so make sure you make the most of patio season at BP. Join us for a long lunch or a late night, and see you for a pint of the patio soon. Asking people online, if you could choose one win over the next month, what would it be? Canada wins Copa America, a Canadian wins the Open Championship over a Troon Royal Troon, or Canada wins basketball gold. Ooh. Which would you guys choose if you could Ooh. pick any of those three? All great Canadian stories. All would collectively lead to probably the story that you're close to it in Canada. Yeah. Right? Now, the Oilers would have had that if the Oilers completed the cup. Right. Like, I thought of that today yeah. when I was thinking about this. I'm like, if they completed that comeback. The, the, the reverse sweep? The reverse sweep. Oh. Down 3 nothing, Cup final. They win it. McDavid hoisting the cup. Cup back in Canada. Cup back in Edmonton. Can't be touched. No. I don't think any of the, Even if Copa... Canada won Copa America, I don't think it would pass that story. In terms of the whole nation talking about it and remembering it. And it was McDavid. And because it was McDavid. But that didn't happen. So I think the door is open for, it, for another story to take... The Mantle is the number one sports story in the country. And those are three examples. There could be others. But which would you choose? I don't know if I'm living too much in the moment, but like Canada at at the Copa. I think Canada and Copa would probably be it for me. I mean, because you look at who they got tomorrow, Argentina. No one's given them a chance in hell. It's almost like a David versus Goliath storyline. And if they could pull through, now that's no disrespect to the Canadian basketball team. It'd be the same if they take on the Americans at the Olympics. But there's just something about how this Canadian team has just galvanized the country that I'm really on board with. So I think that would probably be the story of the summer. Yeah, it it would be except, and this is not to denigrate the Copa, but it's the Copa. Like I don't know. Like to be honest with you, I'm not like it ain't the Euros, but but it's Argentina. But they got to go through Argentina, who's the world number one. It's a continental tournament, and it's by the way, it's a tournament. We're not even in that continent. <laughs> you know, it's like it's a South American <laughs> tournament that they've invited us to because we're hosting the World Cup in 2026, I guess. And so we've never been in it before. We're we're in it this time. And it would be great to beat Messi and then win the final. It would be it would be you're right. It's David versus Goliath. But come on. Like to beat if you're Canada basketball and you win a gold medal at a best on best global event, not a continental event, a global event. If you beat LeBron, you beat Steph, mm-hmm. you beat Durant. I mean, come on. Yeah. Like it's to me, it's really no contest. It, I'm not, you know, like it would be awesome to beat Messi, but to beat like the greatest players of a basketball generation, with yeah. your great Steve. golden generation of Canadian basketball, I just can't think of a, anything better for. They would be one of the great stories in the history of Canadian sports, let alone basketball. I yeah, think it really would be. Canada's been built like the basketball team's been building towards this for the past few years. You right. don't think They've it would got, be a surprise if they won well, It would gold. be a surprise, 100%. It would, it would definitely be a surprise. I mean, I think they'd be happy to medal in the tournament, to be quite honest with you. 
But I think over the last few seasons, you've seen that incremental, like they just keep going up and up and up. They've got a lot of tremendous players yeah. that are world-class players to this point that are up out there and going to be competing. Whereas Alfonso Davies, I guess Jonathan David to a, a certain extent are only the, like the lone household names you've got for Canada soccer. It's really just the mishmash of players who are playing at an excellent level. And they're going to go out there. They're going to beat the Argentinians. Like, I just think it's the David and Goliath. It feels like beating Argentina would be more significant than winning the tournament. Kind of. That's the truth. Well, it's almost like, was it uh, the uh, 1972, right? When the U S beat the Americans, the miracle. Yeah, they beat the Russians and then they still had to play again. The gold medal. It was was the Russians. That's the story. Yes. Right. And that's exactly what it would be. Where yeah. if they play Colombia in the final, and obviously that would be monumental. But really, tomorrow's match is it. Yes. Like if you can, if you beat Argentina, that's the biggest win in Canadian men's history, and we've been one of the more shocking wins, I would guess, in in recent soccer history for yeah. sure. I mean, that's that's news around the world. People are talking about that everywhere. Can you can you believe Messi in Argentina lost to Canada? in the semis of the Copa America. That would be a bigger, that's the biggest story around the world, clearly. The golfer in me leans golf because uh, I would love to see someone added to the mantle where only Mike Weir sits there. Mm. There's only one guy. But I think Dave's right because I'm assuming it's the Americans you're going to beat. And that's always going to be bigger. You know, and this, it kind of feels like the argument, the debate I had with the other, with Owen Noodles years, a year ago or so. Messi or Brady, who's more popular in the U.S.? And I was yeah. adamant. I'm like, it's Tom Brady. And, it's, and I've been proven right on that. Can I point that out? Oh. Messi, Messi hasn't changed the sport in the country. No, soccer is not more popular because Messi's here. No. Not even close. Yes, in Miami and different parts, you know, Latin well. American pockets of the country, of course. But you go to Montana, which was my point. A diner in Montana, Messi or Tom Brady, it's not even close. Right. And never, I don't know why I'm getting so riled up. <laughs> You're right. I, I'm getting riled up again. But, but it's you know, just, but, it, but it is an interesting conversation because Messi, like you could look on StubHub, like to get a ticket to a Messi game in America – it's ridiculous. It's, but a lot of it's people flying up from Argentina. Well, is it though? I, I, mean, I don't know. I, think I mean, it's a lot of people saying this guy's an all time legend. I'm going to have one chance. Probably to see him, true. And I'm going to go see him. And I guess from that standpoint, maybe there was some Brady fatigue because he played for 23 years. Right. There was so a you, lot of chances. You didn't have to go see him. Right. Orchard right? Park, New York had lots of seats available. Exactly. To see Tom Brady play. Where Messi, it is a different. It's, it's like you have this moment in time, you got to grab it. Right. So, yeah, I'm not disputing that. But I guess what I'm, the argument I'm making here is. Beating Argentina in soccer, it, it it would be so unique in terms of the Canadian sporting landscape and v- much more unique than Canada beating the U.S. because we've lived in that world forever. Right. But it's all it always means more when you beat the Americans. Yes. <laughs> so if, like, you know, and, and yes, you'd be beating Argentina at their game. Yeah. Obviously. And you'd be doing the same thing with the Americans in terms of basketball. It's their game. It always has been. But I think it would be way more of a delight to see LeBron and company <laughs> staring at the Canadians as the anthem played and yes. Canada wins the goal. I got to go with Canada. Doing in it. Right. I got to go yeah. with Canada. There's no wrong answer. It's all Canadian No, there's content. no, there's no right answer. I mean, they, they'd all be thrilling. Like the anything. Yeah. If, if Canada wins tomorrow night, I mean, it's going to be an all time sports moment too. Like there's no doubt about it. Knocking off Messi and the defending world cup champions. Come on. Yes. Who could have dreamed Huge. that? Yes. Who could have dreamed that? It with, really you know, is. Even 10 years ago, it would have been preposterous that we would be in that conversation. It's an incredible story. So they're yep. both, but I mean, think about like, when you think about the weight that those players, Durant and LeBron and Steph, Steph's carry over on there. Media, Kawhi's on the Kawhi's team. Kawhi's on the team. <laughs> I mean, you're, you were, Joel Embiid, yeah, the biggest crybabies we've ever come Joel across. Joel Embiid, sports. yes. I mean, imagine you know, talk about sore losers. Yeah, it would be so. Oh, it would be it just would be riveting so rich stuff. It would be great happen. stuff. Uh, a lot of votes coming in for Copa America, so probably recency bias. Well, maybe you sway the mouse, brother. Perhaps. Um, here's our TSN baseball analyst and insider Steve Phillips joining us here on the Maple Toyota Hotline. As an American, Steve, do you appreciate how badly we want to beat you at the Olympic Games? Oh, I do. I completely get it. I, you know, I completely get it. I don't know who's messy. I don't, I don't even know who that is. <laughs> Thank like, you. That? <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate so, that. That's what I'm looking come on, for. Tom Brady or Messi? Come on. D- Thank I think you, Steve. Argentina, Brady's more popular down there. <laughs> <laughs> that Argentinian? I don't know. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, no, but listen, I completely get it. I, you know, I, I, I get why, the, you know, the sibling rivalry, so mm-hmm. to speak, between Canada and the U S and so I get it completely. Okay. Yeah. I appreciate that, Steve. And I, I, we had that argument last year. I think we brought you in on it 
when Messi was coming to Miami and I said, Tom Brady's way more popular in the continental U.S. than, than, than Lionel Messi. And all these people were like, are you nuts? Do you know how big Messi is? Like, do you know how big Tom Brady is in the United States? U.S. US yeah, like, do you know how yeah. massive that yeah. guy is all over the States? Yeah. I, I, think that, I think the way to answer that is we call it football in, in the United States mm. and, and Canada. And football is guys with pads on who hit each other, not soccer. Uh, and so until, you know, Messi <laughs> won't be more popular until football is actually soccer and not like legitimately the NFL. Yes. So, uh, yeah, it's a, there's a long ways away from, from Brady being supplanted. But you get me worked up about this right now. So right, I got to tell you what, I'm, I'm getting, yeah, I'm with you on it though. Completely with you on it. I appreciate that. Yeah. I get riled up, man. Like that's, it's really digging up those emotions sure. from when this, conversation originated a long time ago like George Springer yesterday after that's that right dinger. George was fired Whoa. up and, and deserves to be I mean that was the biggest hit he's had basically all year a three-run shot in a seven tied the game they win in extras and I, I gotta give credit to Springer like he, he was he's really struggled this year they reinserted him atop the order I didn't love that play Steve I thought it was a little bit premature it was almost as if like they're praying he found it again and he's going to hold on and look, we're doing it. You know, we're really doing it. We're going to put him back up there, but he's, he continued to play well over the weekend and he looks comfortable again, you know, hitting lead off. And that was a big hit yesterday. Yeah, it sure was. I mean, his OPS over the last 12 games is over 1400 right now. Now, I mean, you know, he's, he's not that guy either. And so he's just hot, but if he can somehow find a way to be more consistent and sustain the old George Springer level of performance it certainly would go a long way. Now it may be too little, too late, uh, as the die may be cast right now within the the American League East and certainly within the American League when it comes to playoffs. But uh, you know, I think that they're just in that spot right now where they're playing just well enough that you think, now ah, let's just wait and see, and just poorly enough to be like, ah, geez, you know, like I know what we keep waiting for it, but it doesn't feel like it's going to happen, and so. Uh, you know, so we waited out a little bit still, but you know, the, the hole is, is getting deeper when you think about as each day goes by, because not just the blue Jays have to get hot, but they're going to need somebody to fall back to the pack a little bit. And nobody, well, the Yankees are, but the yes. Yankees, you know, created such a, a margin for error that uh, they seem still significantly out of reach for the blue Jays. Steve, I was reading something from one of the insiders today. And, and the point was made that the, the lead up to the trade deadline uh, creates gray hair in executives at a rate only probably surpassed by the U.S. presidency. Uh, you've you've lived that life. Um, who do you think's hair is threatening to turn gray the most around this league, and where does Ross Atkins fall into that ranking? Yeah, have you seen my hair? I mean, so clearly, <laughs> clearly, it's an accurate portrayal uh, of it, and and. Uh, I would say that being the Mets general manager's job, which I had, was actually harder being, than being the president of the United States. That like you did, they didn't have the Yankees across town in D.C. That's right. I had the Yankees <laughs> across town with George Steinbrenner, where the expectations were the same, and they, you know, they told the general manager spend to go win, and I'm like, here's your budget, uh, and don't you go a dollar over it. And so it's a little different animal. But you know, I think certainly Ross Atkins is on that list right now. When you think about it, of trying to figure out who we are, where we are. And, you know, what statement is being made uh, with all the state, the stadium renovations and, you know, people come to the park and, and, you know, trying to sustain that and, and, and honor that, but also trying to do what's right for the long-term best interest of the organization. So certainly the Jays are, are in that for sure. Uh, I think the Texas Rangers are sort of in the same boat and, and, you know, here's the thing they're actually playing better than the Blue Jays are right now. They've got a better winning percentage uh, than the Jays. And, you know, every indication is they're going to sell. So Max Scherzer and Andrew Heaney and, and uh, Kirby Yates, their closer could be get uh, dealt. And so, you know, the Rangers who won the World Series last year, who are actually ahead of the Blue Jays in standings, seem like they're conceding that they're going to be sellers uh, at the deadline right now. I think the Mets are in a position where they're at 500, but, you know, uh, are they really going to be a playoff team? And can they make a run there? They've got Pete Alonzo, who's going to be a free agent uh, at the end of the year, all-star Pete Alonzo, who probably didn't deserve to be there. Uh, so I think that, you know, the, the Cardinals are sort of – so there are some teams there, but certainly Ross Atkins is, is among that group for sure that uh, is trying to figure out what to do and where to go.
Yeah, I don't see why it's so confusing. Like, they're they're terrible. They're eight and a half out of a wild card spot. You sell, clearly. Uh, I, what is what is so difficult for him to figure out? I, I, I can't quite understand yeah. this. You have well, to sell I, I guess, anything yeah. you can. So what happens if they win seven in a row? They're not week? going to. Uh, they're no, not going not. to, Steve. <laughs> they're not going right. to. But, probably okay, fine. Not, Even but... if they do, then they're five and a half out of the wild card. Right. And, and, then you still sell. You know, or – or, or, and, and then if they come out of the break, so I mean, to, here's what I, I mean, I would start the selling now and declare who you are, and and therefore, even if you get hot, you're going to be well. We look, we were out of it. We're just getting hot right now. We're not really a good team. We're just a, a team. But I, you know, I still, uh, I don't trade Bichette and Guerrero. Uh, I still go for another year and try to retool and, and, and go for it next year and keep trying to see if I can sign them and. If you want to trade him at the deadline next year, trade him at the deadline next year. I mean, there's, there's, you're going to still get a lot for him right. next year. You might get more if they're playing better, but I would trade everybody else, you know, and 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 try to retool for the next season because I don't, you know, you've got a starting rotation. I wrote about it last week. I mean, you've got a big three in the rotation coming back, uh, and you know, I, with, with Bassett, Bassett, and Brios and Gosman coming mm-hmm. back next year, so Kikuchi's gone. But all right, you could go get a fifth, fourth, and fifth starter. So you've got a rotation that keeps you there. And, and if every indication is Romano will be back next year healthy and able to pitch at the end of the game, then you've got a closer. And so, like, I think there's a way to do it to where it's not a complete and total breakdown and rebuild. I don't think they need that, and I don't think they want that. But I do think that that you might as well start trading everybody else. Mm-hmm. So what does that mean in type in terms of the what you'll be looking for, like Ross Atkins is – when he's going out there and he's you know trying to see what's out there for a return, is he going to be trying to acquire some of those like quad A dart throw type of players, maybe guys who are having down seasons that they could target that could help them next year? Or do you think maybe they're looking to acquire some more lower level but higher end prospects? Like how would you right. be taking this? Yeah, yeah. So, um, so ideally, I'd like to get. So, for instance, I would talk to. Uh, the Cleveland Guardians. And if they want Kikuchi, I would ask them if they would be willing to part with Logan Allen. You know, he's got a five plus ERA in the major leagues this year, but he's a 23, 24 year old kid who I think is really going to be good. I would see if I can get that kind of guy, bring him in, let Pete Walker work his magic with him and grow and develop and adding him into my rotation for next year. So if I can get a major league piece in return. Uh, if not, then ideally, I'd like to get somebody at the upper levels who could help me next year uh, to be somebody to break in. Maybe even get a, you know some time at the major league level this year if they're going to rebuild and go with some younger guys getting an opportunity. And then, uh, you know, if I could get less than that uh, at the upper levels, then I would take a more impactful lower level player uh, and somebody who I think has a chance to be an everyday player or a middle or front end of the rotation starter but you're going to have to dream and you're going to have to wait a little bit for, right? The time value of talent uh, is what you're, you're, you what you're giving a team the value of the major leaguer right now. And therefore I want somebody who's got a ceiling greater than what I'm giving you right now, but I'm going to have to wait for it and I'm going to have to develop it and, and bring that up at some point. So they're not going to, they're not going to score with the guys that they're going to be willing to trade short of Guerrero and Pichette. They're not going to bring back, you know, the top, you know, hundred prospects, uh, in a deal, they're going to get second tier guys or multiple second tier guys, or maybe a top hundred prospect who's in the 75 to hundred range. Who's a low level minor leaguer that you're going to have to wait for the development to take place. With Steve Phillips, our TSN MLB analyst and insider, you mentioned the Yankees and where they're at right now. And the Sox just went three Yankee stadium and took two of three and Yankee fans are really starting to panic a lot. Like we've seen this, story from them a few years ago where it was kind of a similar right. hot start and they just held on and they got to the play. I still think they got to the championship series that year, but they ended up losing to Houston. I believe it was, um, yes. but it's, it's a very similar feeling down there. Meanwhile, Baltimore, you know, they're not going to slow down. And now Boston's kind of on their tails a little bit, you know, they're, they're within range. I think Boston's punching a little bit over their weight class. I don't know if you assess them the same way, but Devers is a Yankee killer, and he killed them all weekend. And between the panic in New York and maybe some optimism in Boston, could you see that rivalry really cooking here over the next two and a half months? 
Yeah, it sure feels like the Yankees are better, and this is just a, a tough run for them. Mm-hmm. You know, they're five and fifteen though in their last twenty games, ten games under five hundred. They've dropped that much, uh, and it feels like if it's not Soto and Judge, like why pitch to those two guys uh, and dare somebody else to drive in a run for them? And you know, Verdugo's not really hitting right now. Grisham's not hitting. Lemayhew's not hitting. Uh, you know, they don't have a lot of depth beyond those guys in the lineup. Uh, and, you know, Cole came back and he's been, you know, not quite Cole. Rodon's not been good. The starting pitching's fallen back a bit. Uh, and there's reason to think their starting pitching might suffer a little in the second half. Rodon always runs out of gas the second half of the season. Stroman had an injury last year. Nestor Cortez had an injury at the end of the year last year. Luis Heels never pitched this many innings. So, I mean, there's, there's some vulnerability there. I think that they're better than what they're playing and they'll they'll regroup a little bit. Boston is overachieving. That's all Alex Cora, by the way. He is such a good manager. He puts players in position. He builds them up. He knows when to take his pitchers out. He knows how to manipulate his rotation, his bullpen. Uh, he's so good at it. Uh, but uh, I just don't see Boston catching the Yankees unless the Yankees just completely crumble, and I just don't believe that that's going to be the case. So Brian Cashman will make some moves to fortify his team. Um, you know, they, they'll get Stanton back at some point. The Dominguez kid who's down rehabbing in the minor leagues will be ready at some point to come up and be a bat. If, if Stanton's not back to be able to DH and give them some, some electricity in their lineup. Uh, but uh, Boston, you know, I mean, their pitching has been way better than anybody anticipated to throw all breaking balls. Their arms may fall off in August and September because they don't throw fastballs. They just keep throwing breaking balls in there uh, all season long. It's sort of the new way of pitching. Uh, but it is an intriguing American League, and the Twins are starting to play better right now too, right? So they're on the heels of the Guardians and closing that gap. I mean, six games still, but they're certainly in the mix for the wild card right now, and, and uh, I think it's going to be a great race to the end. Steve, have you ever seen a pitcher come into the league and just dominate the way that Paul Skeens has done it? Just eight weeks in the majors, and he earns himself an all-star knock. Yeah, so Strasburg did that, uh, you know, when he came in. Dwight Gooden when he first got in the major leagues was just overpowering Fernando Valenzuela, but Skeens, it's an amazing story. And, uh, you know, I, he's such a workhorse bulldog guy, uh, that, uh, you know, I was a little surprised he got that much love generally just because he was there for such a short period of time. And it speaks to the level of dominance of his performance, but I think also to the level that players really respect him. I mean, he was the first pick in the draft last year in July and uh, he's been selected to the all-star game before he got selected in the draft, which is pretty amazing. <laughs> yeah, that is yeah. an incredible story. I mean, reading stories out of Pittsburgh, like he is is a God must see already. Like they're, Oh yeah. I, 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 my understanding is like, it's tangible box office type of numbers. Oh, like when he's sure. on the mound, they're selling yeah, tickets. And when sure. he's not, they're not. Him yeah, versus when Otani, good, when Dwight Gooden came up, when mm. good came up, they were getting 10 to 15,000 walk-ups a day that he was going to pitch. It was that kind of an impact on it. You know, they're already selling the tickets beforehand, but the day of the game, they'd get 10 to 15,000 walk-ups uh, for that. And I think they're seeing that sort of uh, jump in, in Pittsburgh as well. Yeah, it's pretty incredible. Um, all right, Steve, we'll leave it there, buddy. We'll do it again soon. Thank you for this. You bet, guys. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Steve Phillips joining us here on the Maple Toyota Hotline. Build your next dream Toyota at Maple Toyota and check out Maple Toyota's pre-owned inventory arriving daily. It's time to Toyota. Visit mapletoyota.com. Yeah, Paul Skeen's got a famous girlfriend. He throws like a hundred in his sleep. And he does kind of have that like Clemens type vibe on the mound. Yeah. Like I'm coming to get you. Alpha. Which That's the really thing. goes a long way as well. In a yeah. market like that too in Pittsburgh where they haven't had a lot that stood out in terms of the for a long baseball time. team for yeah. a long time. For a long time. But I mean, it doesn't hurt. Like, it's, you've got a little bit of a mini Taylor Swift situation here. Some celebrity. This Libby there. Dunn, she's got what, yeah, 5 million? Yeah. 5 million Instagram followers. There's more than any Major League Baseball player has. <laughs> you know, and that's, that's appealing to leagues these days. Yeah. Right? Like, when you look at that Taylor Swift effect, that suddenly 15 year old girls want to watch NFL games mm-hmm. and buy pink NFL jerseys and, you know, Taylor Swift's boyfriend's number on him. You know, that's that's big money. It is. And I was talking to, um, I can't, was I talking to Naylor about this? That I think the Chiefs and Bills are playing that weekend when Taylor Swift's in town. Yeah. And they haven't announced the Sunday nighter because it's flex season at that point. Or if they have, they have the ability to flex. 
I think most people are expecting it'll be Chiefs Bills Sunday night, and Swift will be there because she's not playing on the Sunday up here. It's Thursday, Friday, Saturday shows, and then on the Sunday she'll be in Buffalo, likely flexed. I believe that's the same night as the Great Cup wow. as well. And if Oof. it's Bills, Oof. Chiefs, Great Cup, Taylor Swift. Yeah, it's it's something. But yeah, Paul Skeens, this guy is a machine. Like he's earned it. First overall pick. Oh, he's oh a, yeah. This guy's an unbelievable talent. Everything else is gravy. Yes. Yeah. You you add everything else on top of it. Famous girlfriends, you know, the swagger. Great demeanor. Yeah, yeah. It's going a long way. And I think they said I thought I read thirty two first time all stars and Skeens being one of them. It's a quick turnaround. I, that is. Quick That's turnaround. the new guard, man. Yeah. It was must watch. A few, few weeks ago when uh, they went through and they were playing the Dodgers, him versus Otani. He got Otani the first time, struck him out. Next time up, Otani gets Ohtani him, takes got him. him yard. But it's like there's not a lot of moments in baseball where you remember like that that small moments within mm-hmm. the season, but that was one of them. And that just goes to show the star power that yeah. both of those guys have. Yeah, so Otani's going to have it naturally. If you right. can find someone that can counter that or match it, that's difficult to do. Exactly. And Skeens might be the only guy right now. Right I mean, now. There's other great arms, clearly, in baseball, but, like, Scherzer doesn't land the way he would have a decade yeah. ago. And Kershaw, obviously, they're teammates. That's not going to happen. But in terms of, you know, a healthy Verlander, those guys aren't what they once were. And baseball needs another horse. So, like, I, I don't think he's going to completely change. I think it's too far gone, baseball, with – inning restrictions and loading up on bullpens. And when you get to big games, give me five innings and then we're going to manipulate the way this works. But I'd love to see like an old school horse arrive here, a guy that can go seven, eight innings and they actually let him do it. Yeah. But they're going to well, be so fearful. His arm's going to blow out at some point. Yeah. No, there was a push for it. For they, it. they were making a push for it a couple of years ago, trying to maybe make teams push their starters further by reducing pitching staffs and Theo Epstein was working in the major league baseball main office, basically pushing these ideas that we've, we've lost the hero of the sport. Like the, the horse starting pitcher can't be the horse starting pitcher anymore. And we've lost something because of that. Right. Yeah. Tough and, to do when you're throwing a hundred miles an hour, every pitch though. Yeah. But like you don't, but the point, the point Epstein was making AB was you don't have to throw a hundred every pitch. You know, you, that's just the way the game has evolved to this point. Right. But if, if you said you've got less pitchers in the bullpen, you're going to have to make it seven innings. And maybe occasionally, you know what? You might have to go nine innings. Imagine that. A yeah. complete game. That would be you – know? that's that's just ex- basically extinct now yeah. almost. This oh, doesn't yeah. happen. Like nobody – if it does, it's it's a big highlight. It's Some guy thing. threw nine tonight. Can well, you believe especially it? – was it Ronell Blanco? It was like game two or three of the season against right. the Blue Jays. Threw a complete game, no hitter. And everyone's like – I. The most shocking thing about it, and this guy was literally like bagging groceries three or four years ago. Mm-hmm. The sh- most shocking thing about it was the manager let him. They get let him to do it that early. Yeah. that early. His arm wasn't warmed up enough. Meanwhile, they were in spring yeah. training for six weeks. Why are you not prepared yeah. to throw more baseball? Well, uh, yeah, it was, it was, and who made was, that determination? Exactly, arm's not ready. Well, and it was Gosman, right? Gosman this year, twelve years into his career, threw his first complete game. Yeah. Crazy against the A's. Yeah, yeah. it was crazy. Yeah, it's wild. Well, remember a few years ago. Hyunjin Ryu had that great year. He had never even pitched into the seventh inning oh, until yeah. like September. That's right. That's <laughs> right. We got into the seventh inning, and they're like, wow, that's great stuff. The first time. That's really, really impressive stuff. That was when they were in Buffalo, right? That, Buffalo year? I think, and then but he did it when they came back up here for the yeah. final like month and a half or whatever. Um, all right, the filter coming up. Al's brother will bring the heat on that. Josh Lewenberg will join us on the official signings of Scotty Barnes, Emmanuel Quickly, and what Masai had to say today. His take also on the Canadian camp being labeled as the group of death that they're in over in the Olympic Games. They're in a group with Australia, Greece, and Spain. So we'll see what Josh has to say about that. We can roundtable that. And Matthew Shinetti coming up as well with the uh, Canadian camp ongoing ahead of the match tomorrow night against Argentina. We'll catch up with Shinetti in about an hour. Overdrive continues, TSN 1050 and on the TSN app. No filter? You have no filter. <laughs> that's quite yeah. obvious. That's true. That's you a good say thing. say whatever comes into your mind. Yeah. You don't really modulate your yeah. feelings at all. I'll yeah, tell you. it's a good thing for me, but it's a bad thing for water. All right, Alice, brother, this is uh, your moment to shine. The filter was created with you in mind, and... I guess you have statements that you want to make, and then they have to filter through Dave and I on whether or not we would suggest you send them out to the world. Basically yeah. using Twitter, I guess. Yeah. Right? You got X. some tweets available, and 
or text or whatever, and we're going to say send, don't send, or deactivate your account. Yeah. And you should be blocked and reported because of the buffoonery <laughs> you just supplied to the world. Yeah. All right. We're prepped. What do you have? All right. So we haven't gotten into much hockey talk yet. So why don't we start off with some puck mm-hmm. and the Leafs? I've got a lot of the Leafs opinions. So we'll start off with this one. Because, guys, I don't think the. I don't think people are giving enough thought as to how much a coaching change can and will change the way that the Maple Leafs go about the season. I expect a vastly different product this year under Craig Berube. Mm. Mm. What does that mean, vastly different product? That means a winning product? or A just winning a, product, yes. So you're I, calling in the play playoffs? Well. Playoff Is that what you mean? Victories because there of Craig will Berube. be a series victory at the very least. I think Whoa. I feel more <laughs> confident about this team making a run this year than I have in previous seasons because of what Ruby will bring to the squad. Okay. I'm not going to tell you to deactivate your account on that. I do think Barube will have a positive effect. I like the hiring. It's different. I think Charlotte Keefe was a good coach. You know, it just, yeah. this is a, this is a very different approach than Keefe. I don't think he's going to overanalyze stuff. I don't think he's going to tinker much. I think it's going to be largely motivational. I think he's going to be largely, you know, holding guys to account in terms of how he believes they have to play to have success. And if he has success in doing that, then I think you're right. But I can't get there to the point where I'm going to say send that. I'm going to say end it, delete it. I don't think you should be shamed for that. But I'm not – I just can't get there because of the players who – didn't do it under Babcock, albeit younger. Didn't yes. do it under Keeve. It's still the players that have to drive this home. And I don't know how Barube is going to affect their engine, Game 7, in the Stanley Cup playoffs. So here's Or where, in the biggest moments of the playoffs. And here's where I kind of think that maybe we do get something a little different. I think they're taking a page out of the Canucks playbook. Travis Green couldn't get it done with that same group. Bruce Boudreaux, love him, friend of the show, couldn't get it done with that same group. But they brought in Rick Taku, who was just a completely different kind of cap, brought in a different way of doing things. And that team completely bought in, Mm -hmm. and they completely changed the program. That's the type of change that I think Barube can bring to this Maple Leafs team. Yeah, I still think you got to – I wouldn't delete it. I would save it in your draft. Is that an option? Yeah, Yeah, I don't think it's. I don't think it's ready to send to the world yet, A.B. I don't think there's any evidence that these guys, as much as – Craig Brewery is going to demand accountability. There's no evidence these guys want to be held to account. Like, we know what happened when Sheldon Keith said, our elite players aren't playing like elite players. He had to walk that back. Why do you think that was? Because people started complaining. People mm. started hemming and hawing, saying, why are you, why are you, you know, why are you pointing out us? Like, we're doing our job here. We're getting, look at the points. Look at the point standings. We're, we're doing our job there, coach. How about these other bums that aren't pulling their weight? So I'm th- like, my point is, like, why is that going to change? It wasn't really. It was a problem under Babcock. Mm. It was a problem under Sheldon Keefe. It's been a problem with Kyle Dubas. It's been a problem with Brad Tree Living. It's been a problem with Brendan Shanahan. Why is Craig Berube the man who's going to change that? Well, because optically, again, not in the room, so I don't know this for a fact, but optically, it felt like those guys were coddled a little bit, and Sheldon Keefe was willing to allow that to happen. I don't think Berube will. I, don't I think, think he'll ask, he will make them accountable because I think well, remember that we saw Mitch Marner sat out like one shift and we talked about it for like three days about how or how Coach Keith sat him out for one shift he missed a, a shift and pulled his minutes back and we sat here and we said that what is that that that's that's nothing that's not holding accountability that's not torts telling a guy to sit an entire period what's one shift I think Burbe has the stones to sit Marner for an entire period if he doesn't play the way he thinks he should be. Yeah, he might. But I think what what you're asking here is more about the guys above him allowing it than the players. Because the players don't have to say it. The players can compl- complain all they want. Any coach with a backbone does not care about that. Doesn't care about the players' thought. Like he does. He, don't get me wrong. It's not to a point of disrespect. But if he feels like it's an obligation that he has to do something, he's not going to take into account the players' feelings. I don't think Keith necessarily did that. I think that was more from the the culture of the organization. So the point I'm making here is, will Shanahan allow him to do that? Right. Will Trey Living allow him to do that? Because I, I think those guys factored into the way all these players were coddled in the past. I don't think there's any doubt about that. It was, be careful. We don't want to piss anyone off. You know, we really, these guys are superstars and we want them to, to stay here. 
That was the Shanahan way, the Dubas way. I think it's more about Trey Living and Shanahan allowing Barube to operate the way he wants to, as a, more so than the players right. even buying and into it. I hope they it. let and him. And then I, they well, better. They right? better. I mean, why would you right. hire the guy if you're not willing to allow him to coach the way he thinks he and, has and to? And that's my point. Yeah, but my point would be, guess what? There's a reason they didn't let the previous coach hold guys accountable because they were worried about what might happen if the players exerted their rights and maybe saying, I'm going to sulk a little bit. I'm not, maybe I'm not going to play the way I'm playing. Maybe I, players have a weapon too, and it is underperformance. Mm -hmm. Okay. And you know, you, you risk, you risk alienated them. It's a different generation guys. These guys are not the type of guys you just tell to run through a wall and they go do it. They ask, why would I do that coach? What's in it for me? Mm -hmm. You know? And so we'll see. Craig Berube is of a different generation. He's also worked with players of He's this generation. He's a modern coach that cares He's a modern about players. Coach. And... Sure he does. But this is going to be a tightrope back, which is why I'm saying, A.B., I'm not sure I'm not sure the world's ready for that take just yet. All right. There's got to be a All little right. bit of evidence that there might be a smidgen of a possibility I hope that you're right. true. I hope you're be right. great I, if you were right, though. Yep, I'm looking forward to it. I, I'm looking forward to seeing what Berube does here. I think it's a, I think it's a really good hire. And hopefully he's unleashed to do whatever he feels he has to. And hopefully, well, I don't see why I like the players. Like staff, too. Like bringing in Savard, bringing in Lane Lambert. Sure. Pete Van Ryan around. Like, I like the. I, you don't I, hear from those guys, though. You, you don't, don't really know what. It doesn't what... matter what you hear from them. It's it's on the ice, the product that we're going to see. I mean, I, I know everybody was kind of picking apart when Mark Savard got brought in about how, oh, he was supposed to fix Calgary's power play, but it was only like 17 or 18% this year. They were 24th in the league. Sure. But if you actually pick it apart and you look, what did it look like the last six weeks? 28% power play. And I think it was fifth in the NHL for the final six weeks of the six week of the season. So when he finally found something that worked and they got everyone bought into it, it, it worked. So I believe that he'll be able to turn that power play around as well. He had yep. a good six weeks. Priority. He had a good six <laughs> weeks. So hey, we're on. Good guess six who else weeks? had a good six weeks leading up to the finality of the season? Easton Cowan. And okay. what, what's going on with All Easton right. Cowan now? Come on. I love your uh, optimism. Baby. I like a six <laughs> I love week it. sample size to That's get right. it over the top. All right, Alice Brother. What else do we have? All right. Stick with hockey, stick with the Maple Leafs, because here's something else that's kind of been percolating up in the brain a little bit. I kind of want to see a Riley OEL pairing during camp. I, I feel like it could be a good little situational pairing. We get a little glimpse of this bad boy in September. Morgan Riley, Ekman Larson. Yeah. That's who okay. you want to see get a I want to get a I want chance. to get a for two reasons. Two reasons. A, I, I think that situationally, you know, you need a goal. You get your two best offensive defensemen out there. We know that OEL can play on the right side. He's done both throughout his career. But also, it gives you a chance to have McCabe and Tanev together as a complete dominant shutdown pairing. So it's kind of a two-fold argument. Yeah, I could see that. I just, I don't know if Ekman Larson, he he came into the league as that guy. Like, he was a top pair defense. He was a number one when he was in Arizona, like early in his season. This is a guy who scored 20-plus goals in yeah. the league. Yeah. Um, he found a role in Florida, but it was a sheltered role. Now the Leafs, the Leafs didn't overpay him. I don't think they're, they're paying him three and a half. Like I have an issue. It's with not it. a huge amount of money, but you're paying him to be, I think, more four, five, six. Now, if you do go McCabe Tanev, you could argue maybe that's your number one pairing. And Riley, Which I would. Okay, and then Morgan Riley would be in the second pairing, and maybe that's a fit. I just I don't know if Ekman Larson is prepared for more than. Third pairing, first or second power play, and like you said, if you got to take, if you if you got to go for it in the third period, and you're looking for offense, and he's going to factor in a little bit sig more significantly. Again, I, I don't think it's an awful take. I feel like I'm in the middle on both these. I wouldn't send that. I'm not overly enticed by that pairing at all. But I think Ekman Larson is a veteran, now a winner, good smart player. Good smart players generally can play with anybody. And I think Morgan Riley could make that work. I think Ekman Larson would, could make it work. But that's not something I think should happen. I still think it should be Ekman Larson, third pair, Riley on a pair, maybe Tanev on a different pair. Although I'd like to see Tanev get a shot with Riley or vice versa. I'd like Riley to have that opportunity. Yeah, and I'm going to say just delete it. Not not delete your account. Delete it. Not, yeah, just or just leave it in the drafts, whatever you want to call it, else, brother. But I, I'm not, <laughs> not completely against that. I just don't really care to see it. I'm not against it. I think the key word is situational. Yeah. Like you're in need of a goal. Yeah. It makes a lot of sense. You know, you throw your two best offensive defensemen, defense be damned. Right. But let's face it. Like Morgan Riley 
he's not coming off his best moments as a Maple Leaf. You know, like when you look back to the Tampa series and how he was a stalwart in the only real playoff high point of his career, um, what was that accompanied by? That was accompanied by an incredibly steady partner. A lot of the time it was Luke Shen, mm-hmm. right? Which I think is tailor-made for Chris Tanner to be that guy and allow Morgan Riley to be Morgan Riley and Chris Tanner to take care of all the things that Morgan Riley isn't particularly great at mm-hmm. taking care of. And so I think it's, I just feel like Riley Tanev is such a tailor-made pairing that could allow Morgan to have another great year and hopefully another great playoff run. Yeah. And I just don't see going away from that. I agree. That's where it should start, in my opinion. And I think, especially during the regular season, like even Keefe would do that and get to the playoffs and then flip it. Right. And then do what you're talking about. Tanev, McCabe, or Tan- it was like Muzzin and Rosen, Brody would yeah. get together. Right. And it was like, you're going against the best you know, number one line or whatever. You don't want, you don't want might the first, do that here. You don't want the first time you see that in the playoffs. So you want sure, to get a look but you have at all it. season to do this. Yeah, true. You know, what, what you see in the preseason, I think, is largely irrelevant. So fine, go ahead and you can check it out. I'm sure they will do that. But I, I don't see that as a pairing that you come out of the no gates with. liability with? with? Yeah, yeah. I, don't think you, I don't think you have to do that. All right. All right, Alice, brother. Why don't we come back? Do you have a couple more? Yeah, I got a couple more. All right, we're Jay, rolling but... here. I love it. These are the bits we're looking for. These are the bits we're known for. I want to give a shout out. I was up on uh, Lake Kachakoma yeah, the last couple of days up in the oh yeah the Kawartha's beautiful place, oh. beautiful place. Shout out to my friend Mike and Tori for inviting us up. And they were asking me, they're like, "Do you guys do a lot of bit? Like, what kind of bits?" Get? I'm like, "We got bits. We got oh, yes. This is the bit we're talking about. We got bits. This is the bit we're talking about. So the filter is off and running. We got more of these to come. You got a couple more in the tank here, else, brother? Oh yeah, I got a few. Okay." So we'll get get to more of those. Josh Lewinberg coming up. We've got Matthew Shinetti coming up as well. Canada, Argentina tomorrow night. So that's coming up in the next hour. The filter will continue. Overdrive continues. TSN 1050 and on the TSN app. All right, Josh Lewinberg coming up. Matthew Shinetti, our best bets brought to you by FanDuel. Al's brother's in here with the filter. Had a couple of leaf takes. Do you have more leaf takes you want to filter through Dave and I, or do you have other topics? I got other topics. I you do whatever you want. Other... Whatever, you're str- whatever you feel strongest about, send our way, and we'll let you know how we feel about it. Is it my strongest take? You want to know my strongest yes, take Yes, I right want now? your strongest take. This is one that I know you disagree with, too. Okay. So over the weekend, did you know what was going on in the city of Toronto over the weekend? No, I was out of town. Was I supposed to know? The WWE was in town this weekend. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I could have been in the building and known what was going on. But what happened is John Cena announced he's doing a retirement tour. He announced that right in the city of Toronto at the Scotiabank Arena. Really? And one of my hottest takes that I firmly and strongly <laughs> believe in, John Cena belongs on the WWE Mount Rushmore. Case dismissed. Yeah, Whoa. that's deactivate your account. Blocked, reported, Elon Musk tagged, saying you need <laughs> to get right. rid of this guy because it's clownery. It's I'm sorry, you get Stone Cold ahead of him all day, clearly. The Rock ahead of him all day, clearly. Ric Flair ahead of him I don't all think, day, I clearly. Don't think that's an and Hulk day, Hogan, clearly. obviously, ahead yeah, of him. Yeah, There's a four-pack so. right there. I I'll give you the, so. under, the Undertaker's ahead of him. The Undertaker's this 100% no, he's not. ahead of yeah, him. No, he's and not. recency yeah, yeah. bias here. Let's uh, put the Macho some, Man ahead of him. Pay some homage to history. Yes. The Macho Man. The Macho Andre man. the freaking giant. Get Andre the giant. Come on. Andre guys. the giant, no question. Yeah. Way more important in terms of the grand scheme of the, yeah. the wrestling world than John Cena. No doubt. That's absurd. Yeah. Absurd. I'm sorry. Recency Who? bias. Yeah. Not, right. it, he's been out of the guy game wears for a while. Guy wears jorts. That alone takes him out. Because he wears George. George I mean, alone takes him out. You prefer to look at the tights over yeah. the George. Andre the Giant, uh, one strap, well, one tight, strap. That's oh. a wrestler. <laughs> I love it. And the thing I with John Cena wrestling during a terrible, terrible PG Andre era. Andre the Giant. Andre the Giant. No, John Cena. Oh, he car- exactly carried the WWE. That's carried it. That's because. It, that, you're proving our point. How? There was nothing else captivating, so I guess we'll take John Cena. Yeah. <sighs> there, the Rock wasn't have... around anymore, Stone Cold. He That's had right. it, though. He had the same thing that The Rock, that Stone not Cold, even that Hogan. House, brother. Not, I not even so. remotely He close. got people fired up like you wouldn't believe. Well, my thing is with John Cena, and you. No, I would give you, I've not paid attention to WWE in the way you've paid attention to it. Same. You are the that expert. That was my era. Like You that, are that, the expert. But my thing is like, 
This guy's not even a wrestler. Like, this guy is making more cameos. He's an actor. It is The Rock. He's a Hollywood star. What's The Rock? No, but, but the, okay, but The Rock started his wrestling. John so Cena. Did John been, Cena. What are you talking no, about? His acting career is way bigger than his wrestling career. Like, this guy is a massive movie what? star. What? Is he not? Al's brother. Sure, but you're going to tell me? Al's brother. <laughs> oh, come on. It's a brutal take, dude. Deactivate your If I you send think... that out, that gets roasted. Who comes out of the guys that we just mentioned? Stone I, Cold, The Rock. I got, I'll give you Stone Cold and The Rock. I'll give you those Hogan two, built the And w- Hogan, obviously. Hogan built the I, no. WWE. You wouldn't put, a, no, you, you I, put John the, Cena ahead of Hulk the, Hogan? I do. Yeah, 100%. You put that's John probably Cena the, the head worst of, take in the history that's of the like, show. And O's on the show daily. That is, that's not, that's not possible. I, let people, like you don't actually like, believe let that, us know. brother. Let, let us know. Overdrive fans, we need to know. Okay. Wrestling John historians Cena. need to I'm crack down on this. This is, you are blaspheming the history of pro wrestling. Yeah, that's really a sickening take that you think he's ahead of Hogan. Come on. Like, that's obviously not a real take. No, that's You're a real serious. take. Okay. All right, we'll come back and we'll get more into okay. this. We got Josh Lumberg coming up. Matthew Shinetti will join us. Overdrive continues. TSN 1050, <laughs> soon to be on TSN 2.